King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. And shouldn't we all? Raymond Kennelly wrote a book called The Book of Judas, and he says, if you want to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean, to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, debunk its arrogance, demolish its certainties, expose its secrets, and condemn them to face harsher truths. Great art changes you. It rearranges the furniture of your mind. It cuts, it cures, and sometimes terrifies. But it is truth laid bare by brush strokes. These are subversive acts accomplished by poets, artists, and writers. Particularly today in this environment where we are now entering the new dark ages. Hitler, in 1941, sent one of his officials to Paris to enlist Pablo Picasso in the Nazi cause. And in Picasso's apartment, he saw the painting Guernica, depicting the hideous bombing and torture of the Basque village by the Germans. The German official, trying to flatter the artist, said, this is wonderful. Did you do it? And Picasso replied, no, you did. Joe didn't do these pictures. We did. Human beings. We did it. But it was her brush that brought them to life. Now, Rudyard Kipling wrote of young men dying in World War I. And if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. That legacy, that litany of lies continues today. In Australia, we send millions of our animals on death ships to the Middle East, where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed for 30 pieces of silver. And billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive simply because they are male. And children today in poor countries starve because their croplands now produce meat for foreigners. You see, the world is crying out for only two things, leadership and the truth. I'm simply going to tell you the truth. The wise Chinese have a term for it, Zheng Jiao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth, even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word satyagraha means, the truth force. And that one word delivered freedom to India from the shackles of British rule. As Alvin Toffler said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. This is the journey that Joe has set us all on. So what made me decide to leave the world of lobsters and Learjets and exchange it for shelters and slaughterhouses? To take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. You see, something happened to me. I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before, in the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother wail as a Japanese harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. And I discover that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. In human history, only 100 billion human beings have ever lived. There are only 7 billion human beings alive today, and yet we torture and kill 2 billion sentient, living, loving animals 
every week. That's two billion every week. And we stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every three hours. Trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed to livestock. Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. The oceans are dying in our time. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. The lungs and the arteries of the earth. Oceans sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. On this basis, no child under the age of five will ever reach retirement age. It is a mathematical impossibility. If that does not chill your blood. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we are killing species before we have even met them. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a bloody virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. Today, one billion people are starving. 20 million people will die this year from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people. And eliminating meat will end malnutrition forever. And poor countries sell their grain to the West for hard currency, whilst their own children starve in their arms and the West feeds it to livestock. So we can eat a steak. Edmund Burke, the great statesman and philosopher wrote, for evil to prevail, all it takes is for good people to do nothing. Doing nothing is no longer an option. Victor Hugo said that there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Well, let me tell you that this is a new idea. Animal rights is now the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. And it is not just about animal rights. It is also about human wrongs. Now the most beautiful word ever written in any country at any time in human history came from India, from the Upanishads 3,000 years ago. Ahimsa, nonviolence to any living being. It means nonviolence in what we say, what we do, and what we think. It is elegant, empowering, and enduring. Not because it describes our nationality, our politics, our religions, our diet, or our lifestyle, but because it describes our character. It says we oppose violence in everything we do. But we live in a world of media sound bites. It reminds me of Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she coins the term, the banality of evil. This is how a deceitful mainstream journalist at the Australian of the Year Awards in Canberra twisted my innocent words. Mr. Wallen, I'm surprised a man of your standing would say that. Meat is murder. A little old lady with a badrigar is offending God. Livestock production is unethical. There will be no peace until we stop killing animals. Industry is unattractive. And animals are like human children. Can't you see how offensive that is to our rural audience? Well, this was my diplomatic counterpunch. Well, you certainly bludgeon the English language to death. But if you're going to quote me, you might want to try doing it honestly. I did say, a robin red breast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. But that came from William Blake, an auguries of innocence. And yes, I did say, the commandment thou shalt not kill applies to the murder of any living being. It was inscribed on the human breast long before it was ever proclaimed from Mount Sinai. But actually, that was Leo Tolstoy, not me. And I did say, the roots of cruelty are not strong, just widespread. But a time will come when inhumanity, protected by custom, will succumb to humanity championed by thought. 
A man is ethical only and only when all life is sacred to him. But actually that was Albert Schweitzer, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And yes, I admit I did say, as long as we kill animals, there will never be peace. It's only a small step to the concentration camps of Hitler and Stalin. There will be no justice as long as man will stand with a knife and destroy those who are weaker than him. But that was Isaac Singer, a Nobel Prize winner in literature. And yes, I admit, I did have something to say about animals and children. The wolf will lie down with a lamb, the leopard with the young goat, the young lion with the young ones of the herd, and a little child will lead them. But that came from the prophet Isaiah. And no, I didn't say a thing about greed and ambition. That wasn't me, that was Jesus. Blame him. So are you, as a journalist, suggesting that your so-called rural audience is offended by Nobel Prize winners and the prophets, or should I just go home and burn my books? I seem to recall that was a strategy favored by Pol Pot. Well, the journalist was speechless, and he attacked me the next day for being a radical. Ladies and gentlemen, we need another radical Copernicus and Galileo to remind us that we are not the center of the universe. Animals are not just other species, they are other nations, and we murder them at our own moral peril. Peace is not just the absence of war, it is the presence of justice. Justice must be blind to race, color, religion, and to species. If it is not blind, it will be used as a weapon of terror and tonight there is unimaginable terror in those ghastly gulags, those Guantanamos we call factory farms. So talking about peace whilst killing animals is like loving literature and burning books. They are mutually exclusive ideas. A man is measured not by how much money he makes, but how much of it he is willing to give away, particularly to strangers. And my heart resonates to the words of W.H. Auden. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. I really hope that you will do something tangible in the future to change the way we live. The average person can kills or is responsible for killing over 4,000 animals in their lifetime. We don't just want you to change your ways and what you eat and wear and think. We actually need you to become activists. Be active, be strong. We need you greatly. Let's not relive history. Let's make history. Because that is what leaders do. They make history. The brutes and the bullies have been Goliath. But David is coming. Maybe. He is one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? Do not be afraid. Remember Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Our animal cousins have survived millions of years of evolution they have earned the right to share this planet with us in peace. And they have waited long enough. This is a battle in a war that civilization cannot afford to lose. I've decided that in the first half of a man's life, he should try to be successful. But in the second part of your life, you should try to be significant. And they are worlds apart. Men and women of integrity must speak out and act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. As Martin Luther King said, particularly about this cause, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it polite? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? 
but conscience asks the question, is it right?